Hi guys, welcome back to the Funny Thing Is podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Birch, where every week I bring to you someone who went through a trauma. They are going to share the medicine that got them over it and the funniest thing they learned along the way. Today is no exception. I cannot wait to introduce my next guest, a good friend of mine. She's one of my favorite comics and friends, Jen Sturger. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. That's funny because I think when you came up with this podcast, you were just like, oh, Jen's obviously going to do this. Going to do it. Going to do it. It's just something that... I don't know. You and I have always just been, you're not one of those people that I have small conversations with. No, you know what I mean? no. It's like five minutes turns into two hours. Exactly. Yeah. Five minutes turns into two hours and it's about real life shit. Yeah. It's not like I can cuss on this, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Just make Please. It extra. Uh, <laughs> you're like, I want all the expletives on all here. Of them. I want the E next to the name of this podcast. Yes. But we always have like real conversations yeah. about real life stuff, you know? Right. And I think that's one of those things where as you get older you just have less and less time for like the bullshit conversations yeah. and small talk. Small talk whether we don't have time for that. I like, don't. Yeah even in between we were working on a, a show and in between like camera setups or whatever they were doing we would have small we would talk about narcissism. Oh yeah. We would talk about like parents and boyfriends and exes and all that stuff. I just I'm think like, I think when you when you run into someone that you recognize a lot of yourself in yeah. and vice versa like that friendship's just so much easier yeah well there's also like people that are healing right yes. there's something attractive about that and you're like what's your what are you doing what medicine are you taking? <laughs> what's going on exactly what are you do what's the sauce yeah you and know? we're both comedians too so it's like that's a di that's a very different lens than oh, a lot yeah. of people you're you one of those I mean? people that i call when i'm like man uh so last night i questioned all my life choices including my career um, because when you have a good show, yeah, nothing feels better. Right. Like nothing feels better yeah, than making fire. people laugh with your own pain. Yeah. But when you have a bad show, you're like, what am I doing yeah. to myself? Do I quit now? Yes. Do I quit now? Yeah. <laughs> Is it too late to go back to school? Yeah. Did I use that excuse? Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I'm the same way. And I've called you before. Cause I was like, well, I even shared with you cause we both opened for Chris. Yes. Porter. And I was like the worst, which we were kind of talking about this when we were setting up. The worst show I ever did was because I just had a baby, but I was still telling jokes about my dating life when I was single and when I was having fun and drinking all the time and partying all the time. That was my whole set. Yeah, but when it's abundantly clear you Wait, just had a baby. But I'm still like <laughs> trying and the audience is like, who is this chick? Like they can feel it immediately when you're not authentic i just imagine it like leslie man when she's trying to get into the club and she's like yes and like and katherine heigl's with her and she's super pregnant yeah and they're like i can't let oh, you, you in, in here she's like, what are you talking about what, exactly it's fine. it's fine it's because people like they just know and i was in my mind i justified it as look we'd been through a pandemic i hadn't done comedy in over a year yeah i'm gonna hit him with my best of yeah the best of did not work at all because I wasn't the same girl that was no. telling those jokes five I don't years think ago. any of us are the same no. after the pandemic no. if you I think there are two types of people the people that when it like came out of the pandemic and they're like I learned a lot of things about myself some of them were very painful to learn yeah and then there's other people that are just still oblivious to their own yeah shit. yeah those are the ones who have probably a drinking problem now because they <laughs> that's all they did during the pandemic oh yeah for a sure a lot of that yeah I okay. definitely know some of those people yeah so okay so I have a question for you what is the event that changed your life that you'd like to talk about? I mean, the event that changed my life is obviously uh, very Googleable. Uh huh. You know, uh, I so I was one of the first, I would say, like prominent Me Too cases. You know, right before Me Too was a thing. You right. Know? So I always tell people, oh, I'm if like, Me Too was a thing back then, it would have been a very <laughs> different ending. Oh, girl, tell me, I I just have this thing where I always feel like I'm on the cutting edge of shit. Like I'm always doing things before everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's kind of my lot in life. Like I'm always. You know, the yeah. first person through the wall is the bloodiest. Right. And yes. that has always been how I've gone through my life, for better or for worse. Yeah. Uh, so my my thing was I was actually uh, sexually harassed at a job that I worked at. Mm -hmm. But that's not really the part that changed my life. Right. You know, I made changes based on things that happened to me after that incident, but they were all private changes. They were all things that I really went inward. I kind of found myself... Uh, again, and I was like, let me strip everything down and get super authentic about who I am. Because yeah. for the longest time, I got famous when I was uh, 
a very different version of myself, a caricature right. of myself. Yeah. You know, I was, if you watch pro wrestling, I was living a gimmick, you know? Yeah. I had like the big South Florida fake boobs. I had big hair, you know, fake nails. Like there was, yeah. I mean, my tan borders on cultural appropriation. appropriation. <laughs> you know what I, I know mean? What I about. see pictures of myself from like, 2008 and I'm like. You're like, no skin's naturally that dark. Uh, this no is, white skin. Yeah, I was yeah. like, wow. Uh, I have a lot of things to answer to. Yeah. Um, but I look at all those experiences and I'm always like, I, I looked at how I potentially was contributing to bad things that were happening to right. me. I was like, maybe if I strip back to what I am and I get as real as possible, you know, that meant getting rid of my fake implants. That meant really being authentic about who I was and not playing the bimbo or not playing the hot yeah. chick and being like, no, but I'm smart. Yeah. I'm smart and I'm funny. Yeah. And yeah. I leaned into that. Got my career back on track. Honestly, my career was better than ever. Right. And then everything that I dealt with privately in 2008 came out very publicly because I had someone sell me out to the media. Right. Uh, so everyone found out about this very private shame mm -hmm. of being sexually harassed at the workplace, really not being able to do anything about it because I was like a 25-year-old kid at the time with no representation. Right. And also, who are, at, like, who are we at 25? Like, you don't even know yet. I didn't no. move to LA until I was 27. And that didn't even start the, like, figuring shit out. You think you're an adult the minute you're like, I'm 21, I can drink. No, I was still a child. Yeah. I was a child deep into my 20s. Yeah. I think same. I think when everyone found out about what happened to me and I got a real hard dose of this is what the world thinks of you because this is right when Twitter was really popping off. Yep. This was 2010. And I got to see what everyone thought of me because right. they had no problems right. letting me know what they thought about it in 140 characters or less. You they know? were bold with them too. Real bold. It's it's hard when I when I see old Twitter searches come up sometimes. Oh God. When like a tweet from I've like deleted. Two, that's the one I've deleted. I can't. 2010. Yeah. Uh, I will see what people wrote about me. Yeah. And it'll just make you want to throw up. Yeah. Cause I'm like, that's a version of like, they're, they're judging a version of me that hasn't existed in such a long time right. and really never existed. Right. She was pretend. Right. She was make believe. Can we talk about who it was? Of course. Right. Yeah. Of okay. course. So this is Brett Favre. Yeah. I don't know why I'm speaking about it. Like he, who shall not be named. Yeah. But yeah. Like, yeah. You know, he's not as strong as Voldemort. So like, he's really not. And especially not pedestal. anymore. And I think. If you've followed anything about the Brett Favre saga, you know, my story came out in 2010. Yeah. That's when it came out. I was probably one of the very first public NFL investigations, which, by the way, are a total crock of shit. Absolutely. They're uh, going to go, like, they're going to go where the money is. Absolutely. Right. And that was one of the things that, uh, when I cooperated with the NFL's investigation, I just said, listen, I just want a meeting with Roger Goodell. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want a meeting with Roger Goodell. I want to talk to him. And I finally did get to talk to him. And... He got so angry at me during this meeting that I had with him because he was basically like, um, are you saying I can't do anything? Because I was like, it doesn't matter. You're not going to punish him. Right. And he's like, are you saying I can't do anything? I said, no, I'm saying you won't. Yeah. I was like, there's a difference. Yeah. You're going to back your. Yeah. I was like, what, at the end of the day, I'm like, you don't make any money off me. Yeah. I'm a nothing. You know, yeah. I'm roadkill. Yeah. I was like, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. I told him, I was like, and I actually apologized to Roger Goodell. I go, I'm really sorry. I'm not as dumb as you were anticipating me to be. Yeah. And Good I'm an you. actual person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He got so angry. Like, his makeup was running and everything. <laughs> that was one of those things where when you're sitting across the table from a grown-ass man who has more makeup on than you do. Yeah, there's an issue. Yeah. So much going on yeah, there. There's so, so much going on So many layers, there. man. Okay, oh. so it was, it came out in 2010, but it had happened in 2008 yeah. where he, Brett Favre got your number. You didn't give it to him. No. And proceeded to text you. Yeah. And then at one point... Sent inappropriate photos. But, Nicole, the craziest thing is, and I reminded you of this the other day because you were like, what's something that you want people to know or what what don't you want me to say? And I'm like, I'm tired of people inferring that I had a relationship with yes, him. Yes, please. Can it we, happened. Can we please talk about it? You never you never met him. No. You didn't go have drinks. There was no hand-holding. There was him. nothing. Never I've met never him. never met him in person. And what's crazy to me is I did shows in Canada last week, and I had 
and it was th just above, uh, you know, Minnesota, you know what I mean? Michigan, whatever. Like it was up in that area of yeah. Canada. And so there were a lot of Packers fans there. Oh, good. And they oh, were like, God. you're Brett Favre's girlfriend, ex-girlfriend. And I was like, I've never met him. That's the thing. Like, okay, so yeah, this is kind of skipping around, but you also did an interview with George Stephanopoulos. And I watched that interview so many times. And he never just asked no. those questions. What's crazy is that like, was supposed to be my exit interview, as I called it. Like, that was supposed to be the interview I'm, that and every, and every television station was vying for it. Like, I met with Meredith Vieira. I met with... Matt Lauer, a little. Oh, uh, that, did, that, that didn't age well. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I met with George, you know, and everybody wanted this interview. Yeah. Because it had been the biggest sports story all football season. Right. And this was supposed to be like my ticket out, my ticket back to having a normal life again. Right. And I, I felt like it was anything but. It was, it felt like an edited clip. I, I don't, how long was the actual interview? Because I feel like they posted... Oh, I was there for like two hours. That it, yeah, they left some stuff out. Yeah, yeah. Oh they, my gosh. They left stuff out. Um and that was all in the editing process, truthfully, right, you know. Right. But I look at that interview and I don't even recognize that girl. Yeah. Because she's so heavily media trained, she's scared. Like my voice doesn't even sound the it same. It doesn't sound the same. It sounds high. It sounds like a child. A little kid. I and, know. and you could tell where I was in my trauma experience because I reverted to that little girl. Yeah. Where I was like, I just want my life back. Yeah. And I was like, I just wanted someone to get me out of that situation. Yeah. You know? And I had had representation at the time that wanted me to publish a book. And um, a lot of people don't know this, but like during the whole process, the guy that was in charge of all my social media, he passed away very suddenly. Oh, no. So I was actually being very insulated and very protected for the first couple months. But when he died, that's when all of the information about what people thought of me came flooding in. And I was like, I have to get out of this situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I didn't know that. Yeah. No one does. Yeah. You know? And so when I look at that interview, I'm just like, I feel sorry for that girl. Yeah. You know? She just, it looks like you look like you're cornered and that you, it's kind of with youth. Like you look young, you look like you don't know how to defend yourself. No. And you're just trying I look like an to animal stay on in the, the corner, just yeah. like don't please don't hit yeah. me again. Yeah. And anything that occasionally there was like a slight defensive, but it didn't come off as defensive. It came off as like like you're asking for help. And it was like, just like so rough. Exactly. To watch. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that's one of those interviews, though, where I was like, man, that didn't age well. Like, how often do you see stuff like that on the internet? But that's good, though, to see it, because it's like, if you sat down with him today, this would be a very different conversation, where you're like, I want to make it abundantly clear. I never met him. I never gave him my phone number. I also you watched know, the podcast. You I, I would hope it would be a different conversation. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they're I still, still gonna, think money talks. They're still going to back the money. Yeah. 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 They still mm. think money talks. What... And then I just heard the podcast. What was it called? Oh, the podcast with it's AJ. With AJ. Yeah. Uh, really good shares With AJ podcast. Delario. So yeah. AJ Delario was actually the guy at Deadspin that published my story. Against your wit. Like, oh, 100%. Yeah. Without my cooperation whatsoever, yeah. against my request. And he's request. admitted to this, by the way. He's admitted to it on the podcast. Yeah. So it's not like this is one-sided. Go ahead. Again, craziest part of that. I had never met AJ. That's so weird to me. How did I he get that? I just the... worked for him remotely. Yeah. And I was just, again, I'm not one for small talk. I'm not one You're for shooting the shit. You're having a conversation. You're having like a, Exactly. Brett having a Favre. conversation with someone that I worked with. And he talks about like how this was like in the era of spring of 2009 and like dong pics were really coming into vogue. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Like it was just... <laughs> Every athlete with a cell phone was just like, let me show like, you, you this. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Ladies are going to, they're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Because before then, it's like, you really couldn't take a good dog picture. Yeah. With a know? Polaroid. What are you going to do? Yeah. Because the guy at CVS developing your pictures would probably have questions. Yes, you know? exactly. Exactly. But I just remember like, we were having a conversation about the latest athlete that had sent out a picture of his stuff. And I was like, man. I'm like, if you had any idea what I went through with the Jets, I'm like, it's wild. I'm like, it's not limited to Jets. Like, this is way more prevalent, and it's been going on a lot longer than people think it has been. Yeah, yeah. And I just was sharing with him my personal experience. 
off the record conversation this is between so, myself and a coworker. It's so illegal. Uh, uh, and he ran it. He got desperate for stories. He got desperate for clicks in the late summer, you know, because everybody, like they needed, Gawker was putting a lot of pressure on him to get views up on the site and he ran it. Yeah. You know? I'm just like, and you used her name though? Like, yep. uh, that's the part where I'm like, cause now there's a lot of stuff happening. And it's like, well, it's an alleged victim. An alleged or victim blah, blah. or and she knows. gets to remain anonymous. And that's the thing. And, but it's like, used your name. I'm like, dude, you just put a target on her. And it's funny. So I never met AJ. I finally met AJ when his girlfriend slash, I think she might've been his fiance at the time, I guess. Uh, they, she reached out to me about adopting a dog from the rescue that I was running. Yeah. So I wrote her back because I was a huge fan of her work. She's a big time TV writer. Okay. And I was like, oh my God, I think you'd be an amazing home from him. Recognize her name right away. Yeah. And then maybe 10 minutes later, after I sent off this email, I got an email from him. And he was like, hey, uh, I'm sure you turned white seeing my name in your inbox, but just so you know, um, the woman you've been interacting with is actually my fiance. And I totally understand if you don't want to okay. adopt the dog to us. Right. And I was like, no, I'm like, my personal feelings towards you have nothing to do with whether or not you'll be a good home for this animal. Right. And uh, I was this Labrador puppy that oh was God. like found out in the desert. Oh my God. Um, so that's how I ended up meeting him, was when I dropped what this twist, dog off twist of at fate. his house. Now, had he done the work? Had he been, is he sober? Because I know in the podcast he said he became sober and wanted to apologize to you. So he, uh, he'd he already done the work, gotten sober. He was already in recovery. Okay. He was already in his 12 steps journey. And he'd gotten to the part in his 12 steps journey where you are supposed to make amends to people. Right. But I was always on his do not contact list because if you think that you reaching out to the person will cause more harm than good, you're supposed to just do yep. no harm. Yep, yep. Leave them alone. Yeah, that's the that's trick the best. the step yeah. for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the healing part of it. Right. And so he said, you know, when all of this stuff transpired with the dog, he was like, I just felt like if you were open to it, this was my opportunity. Absolutely. You know? What a weird twist of fate that would bring you. Right? Guys. And how many years later was that? Like a decade? So this would have been 2018? Yeah, so eight years later. Yeah. Jesus, okay. Eight years later. And he had gone through his own stuff, you know? He had basically done the same thing he did to me. Um, different circumstances, but to Hulk Hogan. Oh, the video? Yes. No! Yes. And, and... Hulk the sex tape. Okay. Yeah, yeah and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, Hulk's yeah. people were like, absolutely not. Turns out, weird twist of fate again. Hulk's lawyers were my former lawyers. What a small and world, so, dude. And so when all that went down, obviously Gawker lost that trial. Hulk Hogan. Um, Terry I watched Bollea that documentary. Won. I watched the documentary. That's insane. They won, and so my lawyer was very much like, that was for Sturger. Yeah, dude. So. He, AJ, had experienced oh, essentially guy. on a on a different scale and much more self inflicted. Right. What I went through. Right. And that is just a complete collapse of your life with yeah. absolutely no control. You are on a roller coaster and you're just hanging on. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I don't think he had an ounce of sympathy towards me until he went through his own experience. Yeah. You know. That's interesting. That's and that interesting. set him on his own healing yeah. journey. Okay. So it's pretty wild. I think. That meeting with AJ was probably one of the biggest lessons in my entire life. And that was, I found it crazy that the one person that offered me any kind of apology or any kind of peace from that situation was AJ. Was the person who started The only well. person that could fix me was like the person that did it. That did it. Yeah. And it's funny because there's been other, so many other opportunities where people have hurt me very deeply and I will never get that closure from them. Right. You know what I mean? Right, 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 right. So this felt like kind of a gift from the universe. But it also taught me that the hardest people to forgive are the ones that don't deserve it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because there are plenty of people in my life, you know, Brett Favre included, that they don't deserve my apology. Yeah. They don't deserve, not my apology, they don't deserve my grace. Yeah. You know? They don't deserve my forgiveness. Yeah. But holding on to that resentment and the pain that they cause me, it's just hurting me. Yeah. Like, they don't wake up every day thinking about it. Right. I do. Yeah. 
So I'm like, what am I, what am I doing? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's interesting just because I've seen all this stuff obviously has come out about Brett Favre. Now. Oh, now. the misappropriating yeah. funds and And it's stuff. funny yeah. because every once in a while someone will bring up my name. And they're like, man, who could have seen this coming? And I was like, like, uh. (laughs) You're like, are you kidding me? And that was like, what is it, Mississippi? And he took the funds and made his kids a volleyball court? He took welfare funds and basically found a way to build a volleyball court. Where his daughter could play. Where his daughter could play. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. And also, I just want to say this. I find it fascinating to me that the two men who put you in this situation, you'd never met either of them personally. No. And nobody would know that. I heard of the story and I did. I thought you guys dated. Nope. That's what I thought. No. Nope. So absolutely unbelievable that the media, which I think is like the third culprit, didn't blast every article with the top line that said she never met him. Nope. Because all of a sudden it's like you're a homewrecker. You're like, and it's yeah. like, what are you talking about? And I think that's one of those words not homewrecker specifically, but like whore. Yeah. That like is just such a huge shadow word for me. And like one of those words that like will set me off. Yeah. Because so much of my life, like I've I've walked this weird balance with like my sexuality, like in a public sphere. You know right. what I mean? Right. Like most women get to like own their shit in private and kind of figure out who they are and like lean into their womanhood in private. And I did all of that in a very public way. Right. You know? Right. And then to have it weaponized against me. Yeah. By the same companies that were making money Money off off of it. Off of it. That's like. Yeah. It's crazy. That's insane. That's a deep dive. Like that's, I also think like. That's why when you asked what specific lesson did you learn from all of this? I think the one lesson that I learned from all of this is I am at my best and I'm at my most healed when I'm authentic. Yeah. The minute I start like pretending to be someone else for someone else, whether that's in career, whether that's in relationships, you know, just in everyday life, the minute I stop being me and start being some version of myself, that's not me. That's when I feel like I lose course. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I feel like that's when my mental health takes a hit. That's when I feel like I'm not living my purpose. Right. You know? Well, I think a lot of like, especially in your 20s, you're putting on masks, right? Oh, Everything's yeah. a mask. You're trying to, well, let me. Like, I, don't, even... I don't call them masks. I call them, because I'm such a bro. Uh, <laughs> I call them gimmicks, like a wrestler. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I th- it's like, uh, that was my that was my alter ego, you know, because yeah. I grew up watching wrestling. Like, I grew up, like, thinking I could be the next Trish Stratus or Lita. Yes. Yeah. Um, and all it ended up doing was me breaking my arm, going through a t- table pretending to do an elbow <laughs> drop you know but I always saw it as playing a character yeah you know yeah like I was always presenting a character to people and I'm like but that's not me right you know what would what would your ideal job have been back then versus what it would be right now like your ideal job it's so funny because I think it was always comedy yeah even when I was doing sports it was always entertaining yeah even when I was in high school it was always entertainment Right. It was always being show choir. It was always being the drum major of the band. Right. It was always being that girl in class that said what everybody else was thinking and probably got in trouble for it. Right. You know? And that's that's just, that's my authentic code of who yeah. I am, you yeah. know? It's being very honest. Right. I mean, I, I think now that if you could just do stand-up and nothing else... Oh Would my that God. be fulfilling? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's the thing. Then. Not just stand-up, but any form of comedy. Like, one of the things that I get the most joy from now is I, I work with um, pretty funny women. You know, like, yeah. I'm, one of, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. one of their instructors. Yeah. And I think I get so much joy and fulfillment off helping other women find their voice, find their, voice, find yes. their authentic version of themselves yeah. instead of whatever it is that they th- they're that hiding mm-hmm. behind or presenting to people. Yeah. Like, I had this one girl that I was working with on, on her material. And she kept writing all these jokes about her being a whore. And I was like, girl, I don't believe any of this. Yeah. I don't believe any of this. Yeah. You're the girl that watches Pride and Prejudice and is like, that's what my life's supposed to Like, that's who she was. Yeah. And I was just like, you're not a whore. You're an aspirational whore at best. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah. want so badly for that to be your voice, and yeah. it's not. Yeah, there is like, I because that's what I 
do as the side hustle is coach stand up. And like yeah. even mostly between 12 and 16, I try to get them their first three minutes. And it's so funny. They are easier to coach than 16 to 25. Yeah, because they don't give a shit. They're like, oh, I'm just going to talk about this because it happened. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> but once you're in like the 20s, 21 especially, they're like, well, then I'm going to do this. And then this is what I'm going to wear. And then I want to make sure it looks like this. And I'm like, you're literally describing makeup and costuming before you've even written a word. Yeah. And it's interesting because that's that part of your life where you're like, oh, I'm now in the real world. Who do I want to be in it? Yeah. Versus when you're 16, you're like, yeah, this, uh, this guy wouldn't kiss me. What a loser, right? Uh, and you're like, what? It's so funny, the difference in stages. And you got caught up when we're in that fucking, that kind weird, of like that adult. awkward phase. Yeah, it's the adult it's, awkward phase. It's like adult puberty. You saw my it's, eyebrows. Yes, yes. <laughs> I still, they're still, still hot. They're still, still growing hot. back. <laughs> Dude, these are drawn. Every one of these is drawn on. Are you kidding me? Fuck Gwen Stefani and No Doubt. Like, she ruined my life. Oh, my God. Her and Pam Anderson. Oh, Pam's Her... still rocking them, though. I, I know. Gwen had them surgically. You know put what's back funny, on. though, is I watched that Pam Anderson documentary recently. The, yeah, the yeah. Love oh, I Pamela it. or whatever. I, yeah. I watched that. And there were just moments where she would say things and they would just hit a nerve. And it's funny because my career was always very much compared to hers because we got discovered the same way. Mm hmm. You know, was she was at a football game in Canada? Oh yeah, I mean, albeit, yeah, yeah. Uh, very different. We can't really That's call true. that football. You were discovered at a football game. Yeah, That's right. I got discovered at a football game. I did the Maxim stuff. I did the Playboy stuff. Yeah. And then I kind of course corrected, you know, and I was like, no, but I'm also smart and funny, and you all guys these things. You have a lot of parallels. It was surreal. And oh my trust god! Me, and then she had a sex tape, and you had a sex scandal, ironically, without any sex. Yep. Listening to her talk Dude. about her lawsuit that she had to file to basically just get her life back was so, I wouldn't say triggering. I feel like that word's overused a lot. But yeah. it was so like, oh, wow. I've never thought about that. Yeah. That how many parallels are. It's funny, though, because I when I watched her, I was like, oh, she sees all of the patterns. She just still runs into them. <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, she does. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. there's, and like, that's. Seeing what you're doing wrong in life and seeing the same things play out over and over again yeah. is one thing. Taking action to divert to divert, yeah. yeah, and and instilling in yourself a better sense of self worth that like you don't have to do those yeah. destructive habits and you don't have to make those destructive choices and they're not what's best yeah. for you. Yeah, and that then also think work. that's the other thing. Like I watched that and I remember when the sex tape came out and I was fairly young, but I was like. Wait, it's a married couple having sex? And they're like, yeah. You're and like, she wants and I was to watch like, this. I was like, why do you, why? And I remember watching part of it because I think I was in college. So like, I remember watching part of it. and I For research. I, for research. But I was watching it and I was like, this makes me feel so, because they were on the boat part. And like, no, no penetration Anyone that had can happened. have sex on a boat, like, God bless you. G congrats. I went on a boat one time and it was for like, like a major boat thing uh for a shoot for fox and i was the only person besides the crew that was not vomiting yeah and i was just like if no. you have sex on a boat no i get car sick i can't even imagine what that would More be power like. to no. You. <laughs> no and I, I remember it hadn't even gotten to like the they were just like flirting and talking i was like i don't want to watch it and everybody was like why it's tommy and pan i'm like because it feels intimate it feels like you're they're sharing they're definitely people. sharing it to them for them it was for themselves and that's why i'm just like i don't understand I get because they're famous, yeah. but I'm like, I just don't want to be a part of that. It's a, and I think a lot of people don't realize, like, when the Brett Favre stuff leaked, it wasn't just the Favre stuff that leaked. It was, like, my personal text messages. Oh, didn't you have to give up, like, a it year was, of your stuff or something? I, yeah, I had to give up 18 months worth of my text messages, my MySpace messages, <laughs> um... <coughs> everything whether it had to do with him or not whether it had to do with him or not they wanted like a and that was a really tumultuous time in my life I had just moved to New York City I was 25 years old I was getting out of a very toxic relationship yeah um and I had no one and it's so abundantly obvious when like it hurt to read back through like my old text messages and stuff because oh. I was just like oh that that girl was hurting so bad yeah she was hurting so bad. And this is all happening at the same time. And no one knew. No. No one except for my therapist knew yeah. what was happening to me when everything actually, when actually was going down, you no. know, and that was 2008. No, and I saw the article too where it was like, um, 
you completely cooperated, you gave up all that stuff, and they found you were not at fault at all, but Favre refused to cooperate and then was fined $50,000. Someone told me, and this is allegedly, that he uh, he actually, like, smashed his phone. Like, Seriously? in front of them. That's what I was told. Again, who it's knows? hearsay, who knows, but... <sighs> Do I doubt that? Not at all. No. Not at all. I mean, no. that tracks. But also, I mean, like fifty thousand dollars. What did we? What did it wasn't? It's that's the equivalent of like three minutes of playing. Less time. than three minutes of playing time. Get out of here. Get the fuck out of here. It's just so crazy. And, you, and you didn't cooperate. No, that, that was it. When you see how little your life is worth to other people, it really makes you like take a hard look at life. Like I got sold out. Like Deadspin bought the materials of my life. Yeah. My MySpace messages, my my voicemails, all that stuff. They bought all of these stolen materials and and. They bought them for like thirteen thousand dollars. Like I couldn't even buy a car oh with how much gosh. someone sold my entire life. I was wondering away. how they got all that stuff and that voicemail from it. Favre. What a pussy! They I'm bought gonna it. say it. He's just such a dick, dude. Like, uh, so when you come over tonight and like, did you ever respond to him or no? But I'm like, that works for you. Oh, I'm sure it did. I'm Gross. sure it did. Well, and then and that's the other thing. You weren't the only one no. to say that he did it. I always liked. I've. <laughs> I've thought about it more than once where I was like, maybe I was just in a really weird group chat. You know what I mean? And I right. just didn't know. Maybe like there was like a bunch of other women on this text thread that I just didn't see. You know what yeah. I mean? And he was just like throwing it out there just yeah. to see what bites he got, you know? Yeah. And it is weird that you look just like his wife. Like, is that better or worse? You know? I don't know. I, d I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, but like, I that's one of the reasons I love working with women now, though, is I'm just... I truly want them to have a better experience than what I've had. Yeah. You know? And you can't save them all. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. Kind of, it's like, just like rescue work. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't. I'm like, you're going to have to go through this yourself. Yeah. There is something we talked about one time that I wanted to bring up where you said, oh, I found uh, that in all of, almost all of the careers that you've chosen or that you've worked in, mm -hmm. that it's a boys club. Always. I love choosing male dominated fields. Yes. Like sports. Yeah. And then stand up comedy, total boys club. Yeah. It's that fascinates me. Why do you think have you dug into that? Pro way? wrestling. Pro wrestling? I mean, come on. Yeah. Do you think that there's something behind that or have you dug into that? Oh, I mean, of course. I, I've, I'm asking I've, because I've, I do the same look, thing. I've done, so I've, I've done all of this stuff. You know what yeah. I mean? I've done all of this work. I think a lot of it has to do with needing men to feel like I deserve to be there. Yep. Yeah. I think it comes back to like, I mean, if you're going to get real deep to like some dad shit. Same. Yeah. You know, where it's like, look, I'm good enough. Right. I'm good enough to be here. I deserve to be here. Right. And I think that energy, I carry that energy with me a lot. Yeah. But I think also to my own detriment, a lot of times some of the situations I've found myself in were because I felt like I had to put up with a certain type of behavior right. to belong somewhere. Right. You know, like I had to put up with, uh, you know, getting dick pics when I worked in sports. I had to put up with, you yeah. know, men talking down to me. I had a boss one time at, at a complete, like just a civilian job one time, put his dick on my shoulder in a meeting because he thought it was funny. Jesus. And I was like, that looks like a dead baby bird. Put that away. But <laughs> I just, you know what I mean? Like there were just moments that happened to me and I was just like. I don't have to put up with any of this shit to be here. I belong here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's kind of like, I think, because I've done the therapy stuff. So, like, uh, the patriarchs in our family got the respect. And then, the like, how do I explain this? So, if my grandfather told a joke, my dad could laugh. But if my dad told a joke, my grandpa probably wouldn't laugh. Yeah. And then I could tell a joke and... One time I got my grandfather to laugh. Isn't that cool? And then I remember my yeah. dad looked at him... And it was like my grandfather gave him permission to laugh. So then I was funny. Mm. And I was like, that's my worth in this dynamic. Yeah. And I'm the only girl. So it's like that's that a that like turned on the switch for comedy. But also when dad and I had started having issues, I was like, oh, this is how I dive in extra deep and get that self-worth. But then that carried into relationships with men. Yeah. And that other parts of my career and that's why I wanted to do stand up. And I remember I, I'll be honest, I have not had a lot of I do believe it's a boys club, but I have not had very many I've had one bad experience with yeah. men doing stand up. 
Most of the people that give me jobs are men. Yeah. Um, I will say there was one at the townhouse in Venice. Mm-hmm. The, El, the What is it called? The Del Monte downstairs. I was put on the roster and I went downstairs and I'd never performed there before. And I was like, hey, does anybody know what, what the set list is? Like what order? And a room filled with, I'm going to say boys mm. who were all getting high in the back, looked at me. Six guys looked at me and looked away didn't answer and I was like hi and I was not I'm like dude I, I think at the time I was like 33 I was like dude, I'm, I'm in my 30s yeah. I was like where's the fucking set list <laughs> and then finally one of them gets up and he goes here I'll show you and I was like what was that and they're like yeah we just usually don't perform with a lot of women and I was like it's not the 1920s grow the fuck up right so then then I got rageful at that point I'd been very nervous because I was trying out a bunch of new material yeah. I was trying to get a main spot there and uh, the guy who'd gone up before me, there was a plan B joke. I had a plan B joke, whatever. So uh, I was like, oh. and then I went back there one more time and somebody grabbed my water out of my hand and was drinking from it. And I was like, what the fuck is your problem? I go, I don't know if you just saw your set, but you fucking tanked out there. You're so high. Your timing is so off. I went nuts. Now every guy would go out and perform and then go backstage. When I went out, they all came out to watch me. And they sat on the side. Mm -hmm. And I killed it. I fucking murdered. I opened by telling everybody in the audience what had just happened in the funniest way fucking possible. And I berated the the four comics who went above me. I berated every single one of them except the comic who showed me where the set list was. Who also had a plan B joke. But I like worked my way around that. And I never felt more on fire because I was like... I get off the stage and some of my friends are there and yeah. uh, the GM's there and he's like, uh, you killed it. That's you awesome. fucking killed it. What was that? That's the best and I was like, I got world. pissed off. You're like pure rage. Pure rage. I was like, I don't even think I did my set. I think I just made fun of these guys the whole time because they're pieces of shit. That's the only time. And by the way, none of those comics are doing anything. Like, it's not like it's, their head, works it's not, they're not Tom Segura. You know what I mean? No. They're not like headlining anywhere. These are just, it's never the, I mean, sometimes it is. I don't want to say it's never the A-listers. I don't want to say that. Um, but it's, you know, these guys who are just swinging for the fences and missing every single time. So and you're funny, like, though. Yeah. I literally just worked on that in therapy was this whole idea that when I, because sometimes when I work around certain comics, like, I'll get really nervous. And I'm like, why am I nervous Same. around that person? Same. Why? Yeah. And it, and it comes down to just them replicating certain dynamics that I have felt previously in life. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you have to kind of gut check yourself and be like, this isn't that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we don't need anybody's validation, but our own. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think if I would have done that again, I'd probably still be a bitch backstage <laughs> for sure. I'd be I like, see, I'd... but there's nothing, there was nothing bitchy about oh, cause that. Cause if it was a dude that walked in, he'd be like, again, where's the set list? And nobody'd say anything, but there's I was nothing yeah. bitchy yeah. about that. And the first yeah. thing that, the first thing that I would say is reframe that immediately. Yeah. You were just asserting your worth. Yeah. I would still do that, but I also think I wouldn't have given him that much, much energy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Although I, it felt great though. Cause I think that fire fucking helped me kill it. But it's funny. Cause you have to you have to kind of decide when you're going to put fire into things and when you're not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, especially for like us women that have that little bit of switch to us. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> I just am like, I really, sometimes I have to take a step back before I'm like, do I burn this to the ground? I know you have to take a beat. Or do I go, you are not worth my time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The majority of the time, this isn't worth my time, but there have been scenarios in my life. Again, where fighting was the best option, Mm -hmm. you know? And I I think that's another lesson I've learned is that I will never judge myself based on how I had to survive. Yes, yes. Do you know what I mean? I was talking about this the other day, yeah. I will not. You have to forgive yourself for what you had to do. You have to forgive yourself for things that you did when you were in survival mode. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I've lived so much of my life in survival mode. Yeah. And I'm like, were those the most productive decisions I've ever made? Probably not. Yeah, right. But were they what got me through it? Yeah. Yeah. What would you say through all of that? I'm trying, I want to make sure I get all the questions because my biggest thing was like, I want everybody to know she never even met Oh, him. that's so sweet of you. Um, but, you know, people are going to, regardless, are you I gonna, can shout the facts yeah. from a mountaintop yeah. and people are still going to think what they want to think. Yeah. 
are you and AJ cool now? I mean, we're not BFFs, yeah. but it's so funny because I was going through a rough patch recently, and I, I think I posted something about it in my Instagram stories, and he saw it, and he actually like reached out, and was like, okay. "Yo, dude, I just got a vibe that I needed to check on you." Yeah. And it's funny because I, you know, obviously I'll never trust him again. Right. But um. But we are we are cool, yeah. you know. And I think what I love the most is like seeing this puppy that I adopted to his family yeah. like growing up with and, his kids and thriving and thriving yeah. yeah you know that's so weird that that connected you but, like your good thing that you put out into the world yeah. got him after doing his work to come like it's so cyclical it's crazy yeah everything's cyclical like yeah. i said as much as i as mad as i was and as resentful as i was that nothing happened to farf yeah you just have to trust that bad people eventually get like and not even bad people. People who continue to make decisions that hurt other people will eventually get what's coming to them. Yeah. You yeah. know? Now, when they find him $50,000, did you get that money? <laughs> no. No, she didn't. <laughs> Girl, I lost everything. That's the funny part. Is everybody's like, you had to have made money off this. And I was like, yeah, working out a bar job so I could pay my lawyer and my publicist. Yeah. People that thought you made money. I mean, it's just such bullshit. None. And it's like when the Me Too movement happened where you kind of like, fuck this. It's a little late. I was like, oh, now <laughs> you guys? Now. I, you know, some of the loudest voices during the Me Too movement were the same women that attacked me during my stuff. Yeah. And so when they oh, sat there and they beat their drums, I literally would just screen grab old articles they wrote about me. And I'll be like, this you? Yeah. A lot of the people, you're right, the loudest voices, I'm always like, careful careful man i'm like the internet there's receipts dude. never yeah. forgets yeah but i just told those people you know and and they apologized to, a lot of them apologized to me publicly and privately and i was just like i think i told one or multiple of them i'm sorry i wasn't a good enough victim for you yeah Damn. like i'm sorry i didn't deserve your compassion and understanding yeah you know and that's before like Whenever I see, like, a situation playing out in the media now, I'm always like, but what's the real story? Yeah. I because, mean, I've done that the last five years. I don't trust anything yeah. in the media. I'm like, what's really Not to good? be like, fake news, yeah, but also. But also, who, yeah, they're being, yeah, they go where the money is, again. Yeah. yeah. If there's no money in it, then why are they posting it? But I think, I think comedy was my way out of it the whole time. Do you, you think know, that that was your medicine? Absolutely. Yeah. For instance, when I met with the NFL investigators, yeah, uh, they were really getting accusatory with me and basically were making it seem like I did something wrong. And I finally, again, had to burn it down. And I was like, listen, if I leave this meeting, it's just going to be four dudes sitting around with pictures of another dude's dick. <laughs> so I was like, so you guys, I'm going to go get myself some Starbucks. You guys figure out how you want the rest of this afternoon to go. Because if you can't get your, sh I'm out. Yeah. Um, and then you guys can do whatever you want to with these pictures. Yeah. You know, it was just like my comedy a lot of the time comes with, I can't believe this. You know, like this yeah. is, this is bullshit. It's absurd. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This is absurd. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, medicine, that's always been my medicine. You know? Like I think um, even with like relationship stuff, you know, I, I don't feel like I've healed until I can make it funny. Yeah. I have to find a way. And that's the thing is I'm like, I have to find a way to make this funny to me. And my therapist finally the other day was like, not everything needs to be made funny. Yeah. They're like, you're allowed to be hurt by these things. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, but if I can make them funny, I can make money off of yeah. them. And I can feel better about it that way. Yeah. And she's like, yeah. that's not how life works, yeah. Jen. But I think being funny and I think using it for good is... That's the medicine. Yeah. Because I tried Xanax. It didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was, uh, during the Farb stuff, I was on so much Xanax that literally. Well, you said I, during the interview you were too, right? Oh, my God. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm a robot. Yeah. I'm so medicated during that interview. Yeah. But it's so funny. I went to the hospital for, just for mental health stuff. And they were like, your daughter has been prescribed enough drugs to kill Keith Richards. Jesus. And they were all prescribed. That's not the medicine. Yeah, you're not you, doing street drugs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you need medication to get through a hard period of your life, I get it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But also, maybe do some work on yourself. Yeah. Maybe, like, heal whatever it is that's yeah. needing that numbness. Yeah. And that's where the real juice is. Yeah. You know? There's so much about that, especially, like, interviewing people that, for this podcast specifically, 
uh, especially health stuff, like, you know, you're gluten free and all that stuff. Like if you have all auto, the freeze. yeah, all the freeze <laughs> and if you have it and you have physical stuff too. So like if you have an autoimmune disease or something like that, what's Western medicine going to do? They're going to offer you a pill. Yeah. And it's like, well, why don't I get to the root cause of what's happening? And that's what I did. And now I'm yeah. not on medication, Yeah. but did I need to take medication for a certain time to get over the hump, to figure out that it was dietary to do that? It, yeah. It, there's a time and place for it. But you, it has to be both. You have yeah. to also be wanting to work on it as well. You know what I mean? Oh, 100%. And it's not, it's not a coincidence that a lot of the people who have autoimmune disorders are women. Yeah. Because if you don't get that trauma and that shit out of your body, yeah. it will it just sit in there interrupts. and be insidious and destroy Dude. everything. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's like all the thing all autoimmune diseases have in common is that it's all inflammation. And inflammation... Oh, yeah. What like we know with like stress and all that shit, like it just oh, sure. makes it so much worse. Yeah. It's crazy. But the minute you start living your life for like in an authentic way and for your best good. Yeah. It's amazing how much that goes away. So for all this, w your number one medicine would be, what would you think it would be? My number one medicine. That helped you get through the, the Brett Favre, all that stuff. Being authentic. Yeah. Being authentic. I mean, it's that and just uh, change your phone number. Yeah. <laughs> I actually did and it didn't work. But um, oh, they still found you. Uh, oh, you know, God. I think my number one medicine is, you know, is being authentic, is being the realest version of myself, no matter how much she offends everyone else, no matter how much she triggers other people. It's like staying the course and being who I am and standing up for the things that I need to stand up for and not making myself small for people. Yeah. That is the yeah, medicine. Getting back to the real you. And the number one thing I learned is that the number one lesson I learned is that men will be proud of the smallest things. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fucking hilarious. Yeah. I think it's interesting how it's kind of come full circle and that even though a lot of that part has not necessarily completely healed, but like put you on a different path yeah. and you're still healing. Like that's the whole point is like, we still have other stuff to heal from. It's funny. Cause anytime you think you heal something, yeah. uh, it, it's like, it comes in from a different angle. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it comes yeah. into your life through a different angle. Yeah. And I think one of the things that therapy's taught me is that a lot of it comes down to just like negative core beliefs we have about ourselves, You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I don't get offended by things people say about me that I don't, that I know are not true. Right. I get offended or I get upset when I'm like, wait, but is that true? Yeah. Cause someone can't offend you with something that you know is a lie. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's why I'm like, Pfft. that's like once you figure out who a narcissist is, because I was raised by one. Yeah. Like we, I just talked about this with my sister. And it's like, once you know, they're like, that's not true. I know you're lying. Yeah. Man, does it take the energy out of the room? Cause you're but like, you'll, oh, you, but I'm until giving then, you an energy. You'll gaslight the shit out of yourself. Every single time. And you'll, you'll just keep looping on these like negative core beliefs about yourself that you'll be surprised how often, like it'll pop up in relationships. It'll pop up in career. Yeah. You know, for me, one of my negative core beliefs was, oh, um, I'm bad, so bad things happen to me. Yeah, oh God. And the minute I was like, I reframed that to, I'm not responsible for the way other people treat me. Yeah. I'm not responsible for other people's actions. Yeah. The minute I started reframing stuff like that, where I'm like, I recognize that if I make somebody upset in being authentic and being in my truth and being, you know, like asserting my needs, if I make them upset, that has to do with them and not me. Nothing to do with me, yeah. <sighs> My life got so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people you don't hang out with anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was me. Honestly, I had to stop I hanging out with a lot of time people. And <laughs> I put it towards, it's crazy though, because it's not even like those relationships like need a big fight or anything. Yeah. You just stop seeing those people a lot. Yeah. You know, and you're just like, you know, that yeah. friendship was based on something that I, whether it was talking shit about other people or whether it was, some, was the, there was something that that friendship was based in right. that wasn't, was it working for yeah. me? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I also think we base our friendships on our, when we're in our 20s versus now. Like, I'm like, oh, can, how many martinis can you handle till four in the morning? That's my best friend. And <laughs> now, completely different. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh, how, how do you do therapy? Wonderful. Let's talk. Exactly. Like, that's what it is. Yeah. It's so different. Are you a well-adjusted female? Yeah, we right, can hang out. Right, right. Do you oh, know what, who Abraham Hicks is? Okay, we can talk. It's oh, man. The number of girls I pull aside that I just see 
have like mommy issues that like either distrust other women or feel the need to put other yeah. women down or anything like that, I'll pull them aside and I'll be like, yo, cut that shit out. Yeah. I was like, you need it's to take that only a disservice to therapy. To you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're hurting yourself. Yeah. And you're cutting yourself off from an entire group of people that could be part of your journey. Yeah. Because you can't get over your own shit. Yeah, it's true. It's crazy. I love that. How did you find out that comedy was your thing? And was it before Brett Favre or after? Before. Okay. Actually, right around the time. Okay. I mean, look, I was always the kid that was getting in trouble for saying what everyone else was thinking in class. Like, that was my role. Right. Um, and I was always, even that way with my parents, like you said, I loved getting a laugh out of my parents. Yeah. I loved when my dad would laugh at me. I yeah. loved when my mom would laugh Same. at me, usually Same. at their own expense, and that would start fights, but I yeah. digress. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Where I was like, ooh! Yeah. Because it's like even five or six-year-old me could still feel the temperature of the room. Yep. Be like, you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm just going to call out what's happening right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I did like a show in New York that was kind of like an improv show, and they had me play this character version of myself, and that would have been in 2000, spring of 2009, you know? Yeah. And that was something that, it was feedback that I kept getting from executives all the time on shows that I worked so on. Funny. Is they're like, she's funny. Yeah. She's funny. She's quirky. She's very funny in the moment. She can play off people and interact with people. Yeah. Um, You're also easy to talk to, dude. And that comes from, some, it comes yeah. from listening. Yeah. And honestly, from giving a shit about the person sitting across yeah. from you. Yeah. Like, whenever I didn't care about the person I was talking to, that's when, like, stuff comes off stilted and phony. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, I genuinely like yeah. connecting with people. Yeah. You know? But I think doing those little improv shows in 2009 kind of were like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And then after the Favre stuff, I mean, I was doing jokes and whatnot on my on my sports show that I had for NBC in 2010 before it got canceled because of the Favre yeah. stuff. Uh, and I remember one day they came in and they were like, you guys can't do anything funny anymore. And I literally raised my hand in front of executives and I go, why am I here? Yeah. Because I was like, I did not get into sports to be serious. Serious. No. You know? Yeah. I'm like, I'm never going to be that person. Yeah. So I was always doing funny stuff. Yeah. You know? And then I was working for Spike and I interviewed this comic. I don't remember who it was. He, he was on a television show in Brooklyn at the time. And I interviewed him for Spike. And he was just like, after the interview, he goes, you sure you've never done stand-up? He goes, you're just so funny. Yeah. And like off the cuff, he goes, maybe take some improv classes, maybe do this. Yeah. I call that my Cameron Diaz moment because I know, I feel like at some point someone told Cameron Diaz she was funny and she never forgot it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my Cameron Diaz yeah. moment that yeah. like, if you don't like my comedy, you can blame that guy because that was the thing yeah. that pushed me over the edge because I'm like, man, if that funny guy Things thought I was funny, funny yeah. them and Norm McDonald's. Yeah. And I think I've told the story on the internet a couple of times where one of the people that really helped me out of the Brett Favre stuff was Norm McDonald. Really? Because he had the sports show on Comedy Central. Yeah. And he reached out to me and was like, I want you to do this sketch with me. And in pure Norm fashion, it was dark and yeah. hilarious. Mm -hmm. And he pitched it to me. And it was all about how an old guy is supposed to text younger girls. Oh, my God. And he was like... I got this idea. He's like, I'm going to just be texting you stuff. I'll text you. Uh, first, I'll text you a picture of flowers. And I'll be like, oh, Norm, that's so sweet. You yeah. know? And then I'm going to text, text you uh, pictures of a vacation. You know? And then I'm going to text you pictures of two headstones next to each other with our names on them. <laughs> right? Nor totally Norm's yeah, dark, yeah, dark sense of sense, humor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I loved it. I loved everything about it. It was hysterical in a way that only Norm could be. Yeah. You know? And my lawyers at the time shut it down. Come because on, Because they dude. said, Jen, if you make fun of this, no one will take your pain seriously. What? That's so, that's bullshit. They're like, no one will take you seriously as a victim if you make it funny. And the opposite would have happened. I they think so. They would have so. been like, oh, she's making fun of this situation and, and I can what, appreciate it. And oh that's what God. Norm said to me. He goes, Jen, you know, he's like, I totally understand your rep's point of view. He goes, but he's like, the minute you're able to make this funny, he's like, that's when you get your power back. Power back, back. yes. Fine. And till this day, just in a moment when the rest of the world hated me, and called me a slut, and called me a whore, and called me a gold digger, and called me a bitch, and called me all the names that you call 
women that are incredibly offensive. Yeah. Um, especially women that are like in their own power or just trying to assert themselves yeah. against bad things happening to them. He showed me compassion. Yeah. And he showed me the way out was always going to be through funny. Yeah. And I think till this day, like that's still the answer for me. All know. right. Um, all right, guys. If you like this episode as much as I did, uh, please follow me at The Funny Thing Is Podcast on all socials or NicoleComedy.com. Again, find us wherever you find your podcast. Thank you again to Jen Sturger. And always follow, like, and subscribe. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.